O'Garman from Ballymacabry, County Waterford. And Ali finished a, a BAG degree in 2006, went home, uh, and at that stage, there were 90 cows on the, fa uh, on the family farm in Ballymacabry. And in the intervening period, along with two brothers, they've grown from 90 cows to uh, 700 cows. And there are two lease blocks as part of the whole thing. And Ali is going to talk today about uh, uh, looking at the efficiency of dairy cows. In particular, he's going to look at, we'll say, that uh, the, the actual production of milk solids per individual cow in the herd as against their weight. Uh, the, so could, could we, um, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, just a, yeah, so our group, uh, first of all, right, look, a bit of background to myself. Um, I did, I did ag in UCD in 2000, and, uh, finished in 2006, and came home to a partnership between the father and the uncle. Um, there was 180 cows and they were finishing the cattle and then in 09 and the cousin came home and we said we'd split the partnership because it was kind of a just to make sure everyone knew where they stood like so uh, we we're 90 cows and finishing the cattle they were breeding British Frisians Mount Belliards um, from there then I went to partnership with the father um, started reducing the cow cattle numbers on the farm and we um, just started buying quota as much as we could um, uh, oh, sorry, just, uh, yeah, so then 2015 quarters were finishing up. Uh, we started a second herd with my brother, uh, 200 cows on that unit and up to 190 at home. And by, in 2018, then we, I was up to 300, the brother was 220, and then another brother wanted to get involved, so um, there's another herd and it'll be 240 on that now this year, 170 last year. Um, the farm details up to 215 hectares uh, of milk and blocks, silage blocks of about 48 and heifer blocks of 74, 75 hectares. We stocked the milk and blocks at 3, 3.5 cows and the overall stocking rate is about 2.9. Uh, the plan in 19 is 760 cows, 260 maiden heifers and 140 heifer calves. Um, expanding away, look, we've been keeping culling to a minimum. Look, if they can walk into the parlour, we'll probably milk them like, unless there's something drastically wrong with them. Um, we're selecting aggressively on EBI. We started to put more emphasis on the maintenance figure on the cows. You can see the bull weight average last year um, is 39, and the cows is 17, so it'll be up to 28 on the maintenance figure. Also keeping an eye, obviously, on milk and fertility of the cows. Um, when we do start culling, look, we will be culling for the infertility, lameness, cell count, low milk solids, low EBI, the usual things the cows worth. And look, to fine tune it then, I think the project we've taken as a group um, will come into effect. Uh, the plan for the future is a higher EBI cow, compact spring calving, lower than 20% replacement for eight grow, 16 plus tonne of grass, utilize 14 with a minimum amount of concentration. A supplement, um, stock the milk blocks at 3.5, produce 1,400 kilos of milk solids uh, with a whole farm profit of 2.5 uh, euros per kg of milk solids of 3,000 hectare. All very ambitious targets, but look, we said we might as well aim at high and see how we go. Um, the Daesh 1250 group uh, started in 2008. Brian Hillard, our facilitator, along with Owen Power, another facilitator in Dungarvan Chagas, um, they wanted to put together a group of enthusiastic farmers who were interested in growing more grass and utilising it. Um, and hence the name 1250, 1250 kilos of milk solids per hectare. Um, the, the group started, there were 17 members in it, and uh, it's grown to 21 members now. For the first uh, year, we'd have a Gail Ryan uh, with the grass out in the monitor farm, so every three weeks we were meeting with her, which was a great, great, for, the, great for the group to try and push grass as far as we could. Um, we won the national EVI competition in 2011, and we won the most improved group the previous year. Um, we thought that was a great way of binding the group, just like first look, we were the grass was the first thing, but like for groups, I suppose it was something new again, just to try and aim for some, a new benchmark to try and go for. And then from that competition, we did a project on ladders of opportunity on um, succession and collaborative farming and partnerships and stuff like contract rearing, stuff like that. Like see how we were just building for quotas ending, how we were going to push on as a group. Um, so I we the cows in 2016, Brian Hillard, um, was conscious that cows were getting bigger and the milk solids weren't correlating as well with this. So um, 
and like all the group were expanding as well, feed was becoming a scarcity, so everything, everything needed to count like. Um, the group were, yes, yeah, so the group were concerned they were getting bigger. Um, Brian then asked us, would we undertake a project um, to weigh all the cows and to correlate the, the milk solids produced? So in year one, there was, uh, in 2016, we, between our group and another group in Nungarvan, there were 6,000 cows weighed. Um, they had to be from milk recorded herds, and they, the dry of that had to be entered, entered as accurately as possible on ICBF just to get a proper correlation. Um, so other reasons for weighing the cows as well was for young stock rearing targets. Like you can think your cows, you have 550 um, average herd of cows, which you probably do, but like the range can be massive. Like my herd now, um, the, the 700 cows we have, there was a range I think from 380 up to 784 kilos of live weight which is huge, so like for correct dosing during cardin, I think it's been going on for years and everyone's underdosing cows. So from that point of view, this is showing that up as well. Uh, it's also a great way of monitoring the first lactation cows to see if they're under pressure in the larger herds um, it, uh, with their body weight. Um, it also gives us a relationship between the live weight and animal feed requirements. And also for aggressively selecting for a more efficient dairy herd, higher milk solids per kg of, milk sol per kg of live weight. Um, studies from Chagas have shown um, the, uh, the smaller animals have a lower feed requirements. Uh, like at a similar milk solid production, uh, cows that are 100 kgs heavier will, will, will eat about a quarter of a ton more feed. And if you assume uh, 20 cent a kilo of feed, be it uh, meal concentrate and or meal silage and grass, it's about 50 euros a cow in additional feed costs. So look, the preliminary results from what we've seen so far, look, this is, um, there's a huge variation within and between herds, we found. Um, there's about, for every 10 euros increase in the maintenance sub-index, it's about 20 to 25 kilos of live weight uh, decrease. Also, the cow milk solids has increased, increased by about 0.23 of a kg for every one kg increase in live weight. We also found that the higher milk solids per kg of live weight were with mature cows as they're not growing anymore. The younger cows still have to grow, so they're not going to be as efficient as the mature ones. The high EBI cows seem to be more efficient as well, so I suppose what they've been preaching for years, the EBI is the way forward. And uh, crossbreeding also, we found that it's, uh, the cows are more efficient. So at the moment, look, all the data hadn't been, hadn't been correlated, so just they've correlated my data. And uh, for my herd, 718, the average EBI was 135 and the maintenance sub-index was 23 euros. The average body weight was 491 kilos and the milk solids produced was 409. And the average milk solids per kg of live weight was about 0.84 of kg of milk solids per kg of live weight. Now, do, you might think the, the maintenance sub-index and the body weight is a bit skewed there, but it's, there was about, because the new herd, there was about 250 heifers brought into the system last year. So that's why the average weight is lower. But if you look at it, they're on target there. If you look at the first, second, third, and fourth lactation plus, so you can see they just even on, on to see if they're on track. The, the heifers are 407 kilos, which is about 75% of the mature herd of 561. Um, the milk solids produced, you can see the first calvers, they're not as efficient as the, the fourth, the fourth calvers plus. <coughs> but like the range within it is huge. There's like the, it's going from about 0.4 of a kilo of milk solids up to, uh, per kilo of milk solid per kg of live weight up to about 1.5. That's the range, like it's massive. It's in, it's, it's, they've seen that in any data they've um, correlated so far. So um, from this then, we're after taking the, the top 10% of my mature cows and the bottom 10% of my mature, mature cows on efficiency. And uh, we're after finding that, um, the top 10%, they have a higher EBI at 128, and their maintenance figure is about 40, and a body weight of about 505. So it's all correlating perfectly, higher EBI, higher maintenance, lower body weight. The milk solids on those cows is 547, and the efficiency of those cows then is 108 uh, milk solids per kg of live weight. And the bottom 10%, lower EBI, 100, maintenance sub-index of nine, and uh, body weight kgs, they're heavier cow, they're 618. And milk solids per cow was 3.93, which was uh, 0 0.64 uh, uh, kgs of milk solids per kg of live weight. So then, look, you can see from that then, there's over 100 kilos in the difference in the live weight, which 
is about 56 euros a year on extra fee costs. Um, if you have a 100 cow herd, that's going to be, it's going to be five and a half grand kind of thing. Like it's a nice amount of money. Like, and then the big one we saw then as well was the milk solids. There's over 100 kilos of milk solids in the difference in these cows. So this is, look, this is just my herd now, but like the, it is showing that in all herds, the efficiencies are from 0.4 up to about 1.4. Um, but the milk solids then at 450 a kilo of milk solids, there's, a, there's about 750 euros difference in the profit of my top 10% of the herd and the bottom 10% of the herd, which I thought was a shocking figure anyway. So I just want the herd of the top 10%, I suppose. Um, so look, going forward, look, I think it is a useful tool. Um, the settled herd, I don't think it, you need to be weighing them every year, but I do think it is a great thing for the, making sure your replacements are on target or your first calves are on target at different times of the year. Also, for dosing, are you under or overdosing cows? Um, and also, still, after you've culled for other things, is, it, is the system still carrying passengers? Um, my aim going forward would be a 500 kilo cow, mature herd of cows with low variation in the weights, um, producing as close as I can to one kilo of milk solids per kg of live weight from as much grass as possible. Look, you can alter the whole thing. If you start pumping in meal, you can make them look more efficient for the weight, but like this is, this is based now on trying to keep the concentrate down and put as much grass into the cows as possible. Um, so look, I'd like to thank Brian Hillard for all the work he'd done for us. I'd like to thank himself and Owen Power as well. Um, the Dacia 1250 group, I think they're a great bunch that they're always willing to take on new challenges. Um, I'd like to thank Brendan Horn as well for um, correlating all the data as well with us and gives us a hand with the slideshow. So that's me. Well done, Ali. That are, uh, <coughs> astonishing differences. The um, 1.08 is against 0.64, top 10% top and bottom 10%. Uh, Mike, the... Um, yes, very similar trends. Yeah. Uh, it's the, sa the same range as the 17, so forth. Look, uh, to, to me, uh, the replacement rate, we'll have to start getting to a place where we have uh, scope for this voluntary culling. Yeah in order to yeah. find these, change these cows from the poor ones, yeah. make, make use of this 750 euros of a gap that's between the high and the bottom. But look, uh, I was part of a group that did uh, the same type of thing. We weighed all the cows, analyzed the results, and they're stacking up with two groups. There's, there's room and scope for a lot more research to be done. Uh, we'll put a bit of pressure on Brendan to see if he'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, the, um, uh, D Dennis Finnegan, the, um, is, he, is he there? Yeah, yeah, would you come up for a minute, Brenda? Uh, Dennis will say, D D Dennis will say that um, from Coachford County Cork uh, uh, is involved in about 700 cows, four herds, so he's another one expanding rapidly, but one of the architects of Agronet and very analytical, so I think you have one slide you'd like to show us just, yeah. 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 yeah, so I always have this internal battle with myself, like what is the correct cow for my system? And we have one camp that tell us just use the highest e e bulls possible, and then, which is the kind of camp I'd be leaning towards. And then we have Mike Murphy telling me, no, it's just crossbreeds, just use Jersey and have excellent high EBI crossbreeds. So, um, I said, uh, we just have to go away and check the data myself. And Michael Murphy said, look, you have, you have the weights, you have your milk recording, just go and sort out this battle for, your, for, for myself. So I said, yeah, I'll go away and prove them wrong and it's, we'll have to use high EBI bulls. So um, I just looked at third lactation animals in the herd, uh, milk recorded in 2018 and a minus 10% of their production because uh, uh, milk is telling me we'll produce 550 kilos per cow. We actually produce 500 kilos per cow. So if you just look at the Frisian bulls, I picked three of them. Average EBI, 200. Maintenance, only 13. And production of their offspring was 500 kilos. Next slide, Mary, please. Okay, and then we picked uh, three Jersey bulls. Um, and their offspring in the third lactation had the same EBI, but their maintenance figure was much higher at 54. But they produced a massive 600 kilos of mixed solids. So, spell out the conclusions. 
Uh, we, we will keep going. Next slide. So, the conclusion is that um, our Frisians weighed 530 kilos last June, and they had a brilliant efficiency of 0.95, which would be absolutely delighted with. But if you compare that with our jerseys, Guggen, the jerseys only weighed 493, with a brilliant efficiencies of 1.25. So that's 25% that's extra efficiencies with the crossbreeds in our herd. And I have put no financial on that yet, but I reckon across a few hundred cows over 15 years, you could buy a farm and pay for it. And so on a, on a negative point, more fees right again. And on a, and on a positive point, the, the EBI is working in Irish farms. Across the group, uh, the, uh, we'll say that um, would the um, that's the forage group. Would the profits per hectare be very strong? Was there quite a strong correlation with the, uh, the co-efficiency? So we know it's grass-based systems. Yeah. So if, if you look at the profit of some of the best farmers, or said profit of the highest farmers, um, there's a mass correlation between having an efficient cow and profit. Thanks very much, Dennis. Uh, it's um, Brendan. Um, just before we open it to general questions, Brendan Horn is he is he around somewhere? Ah, oh, yeah, good man. Uh, Brendan, just in terms of how this fits in, uh, Ali covered it just briefly. But would you just sort of, uh, you know, that um, I mean, Dennis and Ali and um, Michael, they're all busy expanding, so I mean, they've they haven't acted on it. But where do, where would it fit in in the you know the the ordinary tools of a dairy farmer? Give us a sense of perspective. Yeah, I suppose. Look, from my perspective, look, natural research. I'd like to have the the, the eyes dotted and the T's crossed before we will go to press with any of this kind of stuff, you know. But uh, there is massive variation within the herds. That's the first evident point. And I think. I mean, both data sets lads have shown there shows that. And I suppose. I suppose from my point of view then, as Ali has described it, is let's get, you know, we're all, a lot of herds are expanding rapidly and there is other reasons to cull cows first of all in terms of the physical issues and limitations of animals, but I would see this as playing a much bigger role down the road when we get into larger herds and low replacement rates and so on. I think it is a great opportunity to reduce that variation within the herd and become much more efficient. So. I would say it's early days for this kind of, you know, it is early days and I don't want to be overly cautious about it, but I think it's a great opportunity for the future. And when you get to settled herds, it's something we'll say that uh, in terms of voluntary culling, it, it, it seems to offer a lot of opportunity. Yeah, that variability is, it's striking. And uh, I suppose when we looked at it as, look back on the herds and looked at the cows, some of the animals that are highly efficient or even highly inefficient, would surprise even the farmers who know their animals well, you know. So we, we're a bit blind to this feature inside in our herds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll throw it open to general questions now, uh, because Ali's given a really good paper, and you've got a few other perspectives. The, um, we need, yeah, Chris? Uh, hi, Chris Barnes, uh, Somerset. Uh, three questions. Um, I'm interested in, in the the process of actually weighing them cows. Uh, secondly, how many times a year do you think you need to milk the cord to be, um, to get an accurate um, uh, idea of your production? And I'm sorry, I can't remember the third question. So. Yeah. Keep the mic, you might have remembered by the time uh, the first two were answered. Um, yeah, so it was mid-lactation is when we weighed the cows, so between June and July kind of time. Um, I suppose they'd be over their calving and they wouldn't be getting hit, they wouldn't be too heavy in calf at that stage, so um, Brendan reckoned that'd be the time to weigh them. Um, also, um, the milk recording, I, so I don't know exactly what the group, I'm, I'm milk recording four times a year, is the way I'm doing it, how accurate, I presume it's close enough. Yeah, I remember but like we're, we're going off the dry off date then as well, we're not actually going off the 305 milk okay. recording. We have to put in our dry-off day when we dry it off the cows, so she might have been only milking 280 days. So, we're not, so I suppose the same as Dennis, he's taking 10% off at the end. Yeah, I remember the third question there, Mike. Yeah. Um, when it comes to serving cows in the following year, uh, would you not serve a certain percentage to dairy, and will you uh, put mix a, you know, a specific bull to a specific cow, or just have teams 
to use on a day? I generally just use about five bulls. Um, and yeah, look, I'm just trying to build, I'm just trying to increase the maintenance. So like if, the, if the, just watching the maintenance of the other cows and like trying to keep it, I'm, look, my aim is probably about 40 or 50 for the maintenance figure for the cows. And even again, looking at the stuff John Roche did yesterday, I, I didn't actually mention there, I thought I was just calculating it there on the way up this morning was uh, the 86 kilos of live weight um, per ton of feed fed. Uh, on my, on just on my data there, if I'd heard of the ten, top 10%, like, I'd be, I could stock the farm higher, given more milk solids. I, I, I calculated about, compared to the top 10% to the bottom 10%, about 1.7 times more milk solids off in the difference, which is huge. Okay, questions? Yeah, up, up the middle. So, yeah, wait, wait for the mic, please, uh, Philip. Hands up, uh, next question. Thanks. In a set herd situation, is there, any research, is there any research done on what might be the voluntary culling rate that is efficient? We've kept an extra 10% heifers for the calf next year with the view, it'll be the first time probably ever I've done voluntary culling. If it happens, something else might happen to take them 10, the extra 10% in the meantime, which usually seems to happen. But is there any work undone where you're chasing the genetic gain to, gain to bring that in, whether 10% quicker or 20%, or would somebody like to put a, put a figure on it besides the 10%? Um, Brendan, do, um, do you want to have a go at that? Is there any? Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, Brendan's getting a mic there. I just say, like, I suppose you could start breeding the higher maintenance cow, higher sub-index of maintenance, which will give you that efficiency as well. We were typically using the figure of 20 percent. That if we, I mean, the cost of rearing young stock is large. So I mean, we have to get that cost down in most herds now today. So I'd say that's the bigger thing today. And uh, at that point, then we can make a judgment about whether we're we're getting more out of extra genetic gain in younger animals versus the cost of rearing. But I would say today that the imbalance is far in excess in terms of rearing costs. Yeah, yeah. The um, in New Zealand and settled herds, I've sometimes heard the figure of. 15% sort of between dead, infertile, everything, Volunt sorry, involuntary calling and about 3% production calling. And if you do it regularly, it seems to mop up the tail like very nicely. At, a, uh, at um, questions? Yeah, down the... Hands up for the next question, by the way, just so as we... Uh, very interesting talk there and uh, very interesting figures. Um, I, just maybe a question to Mike there, um, we were just talking yesterday about a social license and not being negative for anything, um, I'm all for high milk solids and profits, but um, does anyone want to really address the elephant in the room, which is the bobby calf situation, which is becoming more of an issue in Ireland? Uh, the, uh... And... <laughs> Brendan? <laughs> is, is, is there going to be many more hospital passes, Mike, just, just so I can prep myself in advance? Well, well the, just, could I, the, um, by the it is an important issue, but we'll say it's slightly off the point at the minute. So I'll say the, uh, yeah. No, look, it's a serious issue. I think yeah. it's very re relevant question. I suppose my view on it is the sex semen, albeit we're disappointed with the results from the sex semen trial, yeah. that the conception rates are that bit lower. I think we really have to consider it in crossbred herds to uh, reduce the number of male calves. Yeah. And I don't per se see the jersey as a separate problem, crossbred jersey, bull calves, from an expanding dairy industry with yeah. more male bull calves. Yeah. So it's, it's part of a continuum that we have too many male bull calves. Whether there's a market for those animals yeah. and an economic value for them, there's stuff in the media there at the moment and it's insane stuff, you know, about yeah. th their value. But I, 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 I don't think the economics, you know, that they're going to be profitable systems for these, all of these calves. But yeah. sex semen to me is the, is the first thing we have to get implemented to try and reduce the numbers anyway, you know. Yeah, two, two questions on that, Brendan, because it is a serious issue. One will say that sex semen, if people actually used sex semen, I mean, initially, there, there might be a hit, like a lack of fertility, but if, if, if we ever used it for about three years in bulk, we'll say that we'd probably crack the, uh, the fertility issue then on sex semen. Is that fair or otherwise? 
I don't know. I don't I'm not know. sure. Okay. But, but uh, yeah. yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. Or, or, or even just, uh, we're slightly off topic, so we'll, we'll go back on topic after this. But in terms of a social license that dairy farmers may in the future have to actually be prepared to pay up uh, 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 and p introduce systems, we'll say handling bobby calves, we'll say that'll actually cost them money in return for keeping a kind of a social license. Yeah, well, we have to ensure, like any animal, yeah. high welfare status yeah. and yeah. that they're well looked after. Yeah. And um, I suppose you would hope that they're, that, I don't think we know if there's beef systems out there that could turn these animals into profitable beef yeah. entities. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to test more types of systems, lower cost beefing yeah. systems. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, because at the end of the day, the, the, the beef, dairy has a huge impact on beef production in Ireland yeah. and a growing impact on it. Yeah. And uh, from a national perspective and land use, it would be great to see greater integration of the dairy and the beef enterprises yeah. in terms of where calves from the dairy herd go. Yeah. And I think that will require two things. I think it will require a more open-minded view from, from the wider beef industry in terms of what is a profitable beef enterprise and what, what can we, how can we produce profit within this and the second thing, it'll mean dairy farmers probably have to produce better quality product, you know. So yeah. if we're using sex semen to drive crossbreds or indeed high EBI yeah. black and whites, then they were prepared to use higher value, you know, the dairy calf to beef index that's out now is to drive better beef merit animals from dairy herds. And I think we're ha we have to look at that as part of the solution. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, could, could we, um, questions again, but we'll, uh, we'll go back, by the way, to um, uh, co efficiency at this stage. Uh, yeah, a question, a question the, for both. The, there's a question up here. Uh, a question, a question for Michael back. and Ollie. The range, the range in, in weight difference. I'd like to know the sires of uh, these cows. Were they genomic? Were they daughter proven? Because certainly the bulls up there in New Jersey, and I'm not so sure about the Frisian, they are proven. And like you have to be worried about these, uh, the reliability of all figures across the genomic bulls. Are they going to give you a reliable maintenance figure and every other figure? Because it is a worry. And look, the big trend in the country is genomic high EBI. And look, uh, from a dairy farmer perspective, I do worry with the, the direction that this, the AA companies are taking. Anybody want to go with that, Michal? So, uh, John, in the site that I was looking at and so forth, uh, there's a definite bias towards the Jersey in this. The Jersey seems to be a more efficient animal. But the other one that was very striking was the maintenance index was picking out these uh, more efficient cows extremely well. But look, it is a small number of cows, albeit seven or 8,000 cows between the two groups and there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot of crossbred cows in them groups. I'd like to see the industry catch a hold of this and uh, uh, put in the research, and, and like, it can't be sniggered at 750 euros a cow between your top and bottom cows. In my case, if I could take out 5% of the bottom ones, we're talking about anything up to 20 grand a year. It, it is uh, serious efficiencies, and there's a lot of these efficiencies out there that we have to move to. Yeah, but, uh, quick question, Patrick. Is this a moral comment, Mike? Then uh, in 2016, we, we used the total output figure from the rip milk recording, and we identified the bottom 10% of cows. Now, I'm delighted with Oliver's paper, and, and we'll bring the breeding work into it for the coming year, but the, that year, we identified these cows that we weren't going to put in calf to dairy, or breed them to dairy. Uh, Subsequently, when the breeding season came around, we actually didn't breed them at all, and we culled that, those cows out of the herd. As a result, I think this year, when, when the um, uh, drought started to hit, and when everybody was looking at where the inefficient cows were in their herds, and we went back and looked at the milk recording, uh, it, had, it had consolidated all the, the cows into one level, and we didn't have these ones that needed to be culled out then. We are a herd that are expanding, and we have seen the benefit of taking out these cows. Um, and uh, you know, in, even though we were trying to expand the numbers, uh, and I think it's a very positive move, and should be followed up on. Okay. The um, thanks, Padraig. Uh, uh, yeah, quick question over here. We uh, one back there. Yeah. 
G'day. Um, I'm Timothy Barnett. Uh, I'd just like to make three comments. One com the first comment I'd like to talk about was Lincoln University Demonstration Farm, which, which they dramatically changed the way in which they, uh, their carbon footprint or their impact on the environment. And the first thing they really had to uh, grapple was, was the size of cow within the herd. As they moved to a less impact system, they needed to change their cow. And one of the conclusions they came to quite strongly was that size does matter. It matters when the cow approaches the face of a, of a clamp or a, uh, a break. Uh, it also, as the gentleman said before, that it's about dosing, but it's also about feeding. So they were consistent when they brought their cows down and they moved from a, a more Frisian cow to a more Jersey cow, albeit quite small. They did really notice that they needed to have a consistent size in their cows as well, and a, a consistent weight. The second thing was uh, about the sex team. I just want to make a quick comment is that you know, we are bringing in some sex semen this year, but we are advising that it's going to be used judiciously. It's, it must be fitted in to a herd and proven plan in that we are looking for the, the most fertile cows. We're looking for those maiden heifers that, will car, uh, that, that you will mate a couple of days or a week earlier just so that you can give yourself that opportunity to catch up if, if things don't go well. But sex semen is going to be something that will be available, but really we'll be looking to be advising people to use it judiciously, to be careful around how they do it, and only choose cows after some real strong management, uh, uh, strong management skills are pointed out, which are your most fertile cows, and when they're actually on heat, so, um, or when, when they're actually standing. So that'll be, and, uh, um, and the third thing was David Chin, who's quite a big chap in um, LIC in New Zealand, has just put out a paper in which he would argue, and whether it's going to be right or wrong, but he would argue that no matter what you choose for your criteria when you're looking to select a breeding uh, objective, he would argue that if you're clear, concise, and consistent over what you're trying to achieve, then you will, the best way to reach your goal would be to drop the, ten, the worst 10% performance. Under what the criteria you've chosen, drop them out of the herd in terms of breeding and, only, and put them to beef. And he would contend over other management uh, skills to try and improve the genetic worth of your herd. That is the easiest and simplest way to do it and the way in which he would say you would ensure genetic gain going forward, particularly that the heifers coming into the herd will be better than their mothers. So that's my three comments. So Thanks, I'll take that as a comment. And um, question, there was, was there? Yeah, one over here, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Mark Reed Dorset. Um, it was more of a, a question, it's much easier for a, a smaller uh, Jersey crossbred cow, say 380, 400 kilos, to produce a body weight in milk solids than it is for a, a slightly larger cow. But if you only select on that, are you going to end up breeding smaller and smaller cows, or do you have a minimum um, body weight, like say 500 kilo cow producing 500 kilos of milk solids? Um, yeah, there's just a question about that. Yeah, I suppose if the data does become back, like the way it is correlating the 2025 20, kilos. Are, are yours for the maintenance sub-index for, for the live weight reduction. So my plan would be to keep the maintenance at around 40 or 50, which would give me the 500 kilo cow. Um, so that's where I'm going with that, yeah. yeah. Do you want to answer that one, Mike? You've been into good interest in the area. Sure. Um, to me, an efficient cow is an efficient cow. And if you have two cows at 500 kilos, and one of them is producing 0.8 of our weight, and another one is producing 1.2, there's obviously a lot more profitability. And that's standard across cows up and down the weight. So if you have a 400 kilo cow that's only doing 300 kilos, you need to sort her out. And if you have a 600 cow, kilo cow, my, my brother had a, a 600 kilo cow that was doing 540 kilos of milk cells. He thought she was a super cow until we looked at this figure. And in this parameter, she was only producing 80% of her body weight, whereas he had 500 kilo cows that were doing 1.4. It's just an, a slightly different parameter that we. Uh, are highlighting here today as, as, uh, as potential to increase efficiencies on farm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we hear a lot about, um, you know, the, the amount of grass we grow and harvest. And, uh, but if we think about, if you have a thousand acres of harvestable grass, and if you run it through efficient cows, uh, yeah, you'll produce considerably more milk solids than if you run it through inefficient cows. So it's, uh, it, yeah. It's something we should aim for, but I mean that uh, I mean Brenda put a perspective on the timing. Uh, I take one or two last questions if uh, if anybody has. Yeah, yeah, we're done the on the right.
Um, when you're comparing efficiencies to milk solids, surely you need to be looking at um, body weight compared to body condition score as well? Um, sorry, I, I actually didn't mention that. We were, we were doing it on body condition score as well. We were weighing the cows and we were body condition scoring them at the same time. And that correlation should, is working life. They're in the right body condition. That's where they should be for their maintenance figure on their weight. Okay. Any last question?